All right, very cool. People are streaming in. I'll just leave my screen on for the moment. And once you start talking, I will take it away. Okay. Sounds good. I think people can hear us. We're live. Yeah, I know. <laughs> good. We are going to give people a few minutes to, to join. We see people streaming in. This is really exciting. We have folks from around the world joining today. So um, just really, really happy to have you here. Thanks for, thanks for joining. We'll start at maybe two minutes past the hour. Hey, Javier. Hello. <laughs> hey, everybody. Maybe for those, oh, sorry. Go for it. Yeah, those who are now dropping in, um, I might uh, ask you just to present yourself quickly uh, and what your interests are and so on, uh, just to have an, an idea about your fields of interest. And I'm going to launch a poll right now that will keep open for about 30 to 90 seconds or so. Um, and get a little info about where you're located and what your level of drone expertise is, just to um, fill out while, while we're waiting to get this started. Launching the poll now. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep that open for 60 seconds or so. Oh, this is cool. <laughs> uh, exciting to see people from around the world joining. Thanks for, thanks for saying hi. Sweet, 80 of the 100 people have voted so far. This is this is good. We have Guatemala, Mexico. I think I saw Portland, Oregon. Super, super cool. And we'll have the, the chat. Um, we'll be able to review that after. So um, even if it's speeding by right here, it's uh, welcome to introduce yourself and, and uh, super happy to have you. All right, we had almost 100 people respond. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and we're gonna get started. Thanks everyone for, for voting. All right, um, share results, sure. So yeah, I'm gonna provide a, just a super brief intro to myself um, and what we're doing today and I set the agenda. So my name is Ross Burnett. I work at One Tree Planted. We are a nonprofit that works around the world to support tree planting organizations. Um, we have about an hour of presentation material today and then we're gonna leave some time at the end for Q&A. If you can stay longer, great. We're happy to be here as long as people have questions. Um, and then can certainly continue the conversation offline. Uh, you should be able to find our contact info and don't hesitate to use the chat um, to uh, connect with folks. So really exciting to have you here. I'm gonna hand it over to Patrick um, and then share a little material. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Patrick. I'm CEO and co-founder of Open Forest. And within the company, I have been working uh, with drones for at least one decade now. And that's also uh, the experience uh, which I want to share with you. And yeah, I think that's enough. You will be listening enough from my side <laughs> for the next hour. So I will just pass the ball again to Ross uh, awesome. to give us an introduction Thank you so of much the organization. Me. Um, so I want to give a little overview of One Tree Planted and then also um, highlight a couple of our partners uh, to show what they're doing uh, with drones. So I'm going to just show a quick little uh, 90 second video, which does a great job of capturing what we do at One Tree Planted and also just highlights a really talented video and design team. So I'm going to get, go ahead and get that started. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hey there, we're One Tree Planted, and this is what we do. At One Tree Planted, our job is simple. Get trees in the ground. Why? Because planting trees is one of the most important things we can do for our environment. Trees clean our air by absorbing harmful pollutants, filter our water and prevent floods and landslides, strengthen biodiversity by providing habitats for millions of species of animals and plants, improve our health, create jobs, and protect our climate by capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We work with partners in four key regions to support their forest restoration projects. Thanks to you, we have already planted millions of trees and are on track to plant millions more. So how does it work? For every dollar we raise, we plant one tree. When you donate to us, we pull the money and distribute it across our various projects. Our partners then grow the saplings and send teams to plant them during the rainy season. The young trees are then maintained and monitored as they grow, and we report on the impact generated. If you want to make an impact, we've made it easy. Simply head over to our website, choose a location, let us know how many trees you want planted, and we'll take care of the rest. Together, we can restore our forests, one tree at a time. All right, um, cool. So I think that did a really, really great job of showing um, what we do, and it's really exciting. I know I saw many of our project partners already um, dropping a line in the chat. So uh, we couldn't do the work that we do without y'all, and we're excited to, to elevate and learn today about how we can use drones to improve that monitoring portion of the work that we know is so important. So I am just going to highlight um, four partners. I know that um, uh, we have many partners that are doing really great drone uh, work with drones uh, beyond these four, but I just happen to either have a personal relationship and have visited the site or have just had an opportunity to, to chat and learn with some of these folks more. Um, so we're going to highlight the Feather River District. That's a group that works in the Sierra Nevadas in California, uh, close to where I live in, in Berkeley in the Bay Area. OSA Conservation works in Costa Rica. Um, does really amazing drone work across the board. Uh, Wells for Zoe is an Irish uh, charity that works in Malawi. And um, Aipe, Aipe is uh, the Institute Pesquitas Ecologicas that, uh, that works in Brazil on the Quarters for Life. So I'm just super quickly going to show a couple of their um, projects or how, how they've used drones in the past. Um, this is the first one. This is from the Feather River District in California. This is what's called a, a 360 pano. Uh, it really provides the ability to see a landscape and it's pretty easy to do. Patrick is gonna talk all about each of these techniques during his presentation, but I just wanna show some real world examples from what we're working with. This is showing post fire uh, from over 10 years ago, uh, the landscape in the Sierra Nevada and just really allows you to, to see, the, see the context. Um, our partners in OSA Conservation, um, this is a 360 or a 3D model that was done of one of their projects working in, in the mangroves on the Osa Peninsula and just really super high resolution ability to see, um, see the projects. Uh, Wells for Zoe actually has used the Explorer land platform, which Patrick will talk more about to upload some drone maps. Um, and this is a really high resolution uh, drone map that they use to show their, show their project. Um, zooming in, you can see much higher level of detail than might be available just from the satellite base maps that are available. You can really see um, the difference in what's possible with, with high resolution drone imagery. You can see these individual trees much more clearly. Um, and finally, from um, IPE, uh, this is a really cool aerial photograph of a before and after of a restoration site. So this is 2016. And then three years later, you can see that same coastline along the Paranaanapa, say that correctly, river. Um, and just to catch that again, this really shows people are interested in seeing what are these trees, how do they look like after a couple years? And drones provide this ability to show it at a landscape scale. So this coast, uh, this kind of river uh, coastline here um, is really well developed with um, tree canopy that you can actually see from the, from the air much more visibly after a few years. Um, here's one more example from them. Um, this is the before 2016 or so, and then 
2019. That's a different angle. So it's important to remember, like, let's get the same angle. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to learn more about that. But yeah, this area, um, the importance of protecting the kind of riparian zones along the river. Um, so that is actually um, all I have um, for, for now. And going to hand it over to Patrick. Um, again, many of our partners doing amazing work and hoping to use this opportunity to connect and learn from you all. Um, so thank you so much. And let me hand it over to Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Um, before I pass over to, to the presentation, let me just um, give you some, some information also about our company, uh, which I didn't do uh, previously. Um, very quickly, Open Forest is a company which is engaged in supporting organizations like One Tree Planted. And we have been developing different tools, uh, like we started with drone imagery uh, in, with the goal to build up transparency, but we have been working with web maps, with satellite images, with forest information systems and so on. So all these technological tools that help organizations to carry out their projects, um, um, to better carry out their projects. And uh, maybe at the end, we will have time to present what is our latest tool, which is Explore.Land, which Ross already presented. And so in this role, or with this goal, we started to work with drones like 10 years ago when drones were still like um, um, non-existing in, in, in the media and so on. And we had the chance really to develop some, some applications and for me pers personally to gather some experience. And today what I will do, uh, maybe I'll start sharing my screen. Let me check if I, okay. Can you just confirm that you're seeing my screen? Yep, I can see the welcome. Um... Yep, I can see a slide that says content, yep. Okay, there's something not working, just one second. I have to start it again. Okay, now. So today the goal will be just to give you really um, an introduction to how to use, let's say, and consumer drones to do mapping and maybe I will have time also to show some other stuff, uh, which Ross uh, partially already showed. And this is the reason this the presentation today is a condensation of a five day workshop I have been doing in Asia and Latin America. So I had a hard time to throw stuff away. And uh, my goal was to get to the 30 minutes. I don't think I managed it, but I hope that in the next 45 minutes to maximum one hour, I will be able to go through. And it's also only the, 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 the top, how you say it, of, of the iceberg. So there's a really a lot, a lot I would like to share with you, mainly those who are starting now, uh, but maybe we'll have the opp opportunity to do it at a later point in time. So what will I uh, talk about? Obviously, give you an introduction to drones. I would like also to make a very quick comparison of drones with other remote sensing solutions. There will be only one slide talking about sensors, and then I will give you a very short overview uh, over what photogrammetry is, which is what we need to do mapping. Uh, and I will lose, or not lose, I will um, say some words about what you have to look at when you will acquire a drone and then how to plan and execute a mission. Um, a few days ago, we went onto the field and tried to do a small video showing how a mapping mission would look like in the field, since we are not together at the same spot to do it in real time. So we will pass that. I will be talking about some examples of data analysis and then finally end up talking about the presentations tools uh, we could use using the material produced by drones, like for instance, uh, or explorer.land platform, and just really then round up with a few comments about security and legal aspects. And the time we will have afterwards will be dedicated to questions and answers. So I already told you this, uh, just maybe one sentence. 
uh, people use, uh, well, it's typical to do the same mistakes over and over again when you start. And so I hope I will be able to deliver some, let's say, inside information in the sense that you won't do the typical mistakes when you start using drones to map. So the big question is, what is a drone? And I like to start with this image. Uh, I suppose everyone will recognize that we're seeing a military drone here, but immediately after I show this image and somehow you will say, okay, that's also a toy drone. So some, we have here two devices which are completely different, but they're called drones. So what is the difference or what is the common aspect of these two devices? I will go through different designations of drones, which include also some characteristics of drones. So in the past, because of this relation or of the word drone with the military part, people use more the, the term UAV for unmanned aerial vehicle. And there are some variations of this, of this um, 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 acronym. Uh, but in fact, what you have here is what this name is saying is that we're, when we're talking about drones, we're talking about aerial vehicles and at the same time that they're unmanned. There are some other designations, which includes in the description that we're talking also about remotely controlled or remotely piloted devices. And I would like to add that we will be talking also about the multi-component system that you will be able to fly beyond line of sight. And I think the most important one here is that we will have uh, an autonomous flight. So without any interference, the drone will fly by itself. So finally, what we have in, in some way is an aerial robot. Um, and I think this is really what defines a drone, be it a toy drone, be it a, a military drone. So there are different types of drones, or let's say also UAVs, but we will be focusing just on two types. On the one side, we have the fixed wings, which are airplanes, and you have here two examples. Uh, and on the other side, you have what we call the multicopters, which in fact are helicopters. And you see here three examples. We have the well-known uh, DJI Phantom, which was the drone which really revolutionized the drone market globally. But there are different drones. So this is an example of the drone we started to work with 10 years ago. It's an octocopter, but you have also uh, this normal helicopter as a drone. Now, what is or what are the main differences between these two types of drones? Well, the fixed wing being an airplane needs always some space to take off and land. And once it's in the air, it will be always in movement, uh, which is just intrinsic, intrinsic to, to its nature because being an airplane, it has to move to keep up the aerodynamics. The multicopter uh, can take off in a vertical manner. And once in the air, you can also position the drone at a certain point in 3D and let, let it hover there. So it's a completely different way of flying compared to, to the fixed wing. And these differences have some advantages and disadvantages. So first of all, the fixed wings, the airplanes by their nature are energetically more efficient. So this uh, obviously as a consequence, you will have longer flight times and longer flight trajectories in comparison to the multicopter, but they have this disadvantage that you need some space to take off. And that's where the multicopter will um, has some uh, positive points, namely that you have this quite simplified takeoff and landing for being vertical, and you have the possibility to position the drone in space. Now, just to mention this, some companies, they try to take the best of the two worlds and uh, created uh, different types of hybrid drones which use the multicopter principle to take off, but once they're in the air, they go over to a plane mode, uh, which allows to use all the benefits of a plane. So I just wanted to mention you this because in the context of forest, this might be a good or important solution. Just three additional informations, um, just to, for you to have an idea about which sizes we're talking about. 
So typically drones um, uh, have sizes between half a meter and three meters. Nowadays, uh, drones and mainly copters are becoming smaller and smaller. So I should maybe add that you have drones which are as big as your hand, which already have the capability to do mapping. Maybe also important to mention is that mainly you will be working with electrical devices, which are easy to use, but there are some combustion or drones based on combustion propulsion, uh, which have a much higher um, energy density. And so you have drones which are able to stay in the air like for two, three days um, because of this type of combustion. But normally like 95% of, of the time people are working now with electrical solutions which are also getting better and better. And the last point for this slide is you have commercial drones. So they're based on proprietary technologies. They have some advantages like ready to fly, you have some support and so on. Uh, but the downside is if something breaks or so on, it's quite expensive. But on the other side, you have like open source based drones uh, like the DIY do-it-yourself drones which have this advantage that you can tune and adapt the drone to your needs. Uh, and if something breaks, normally the access to the, the parts is, is easy and cheap. And the good thing is some companies, they uh, specialized in taking the open source stuff and, and create it like commercial drones based on open source, much cheaper than some commercial um, cousins. Now, <clears throat> Just have a glass of water. One very important thing to understand is that the drone is not just the, the vehicle itself. It's a whole system of components which are all important for a drone to work correctly, and especially if we're talking about mapping missions. So we have the, the vehicle itself, which is the frame, the motors, controllers, batteries, and so on. And within this frame, we have navigation sensors to start with the GPS device, uh, but there are a lot of other um, sensors, all of them uh, important to know the exact position, orientation, velocity of the drone. Then you have the onboard computer, which is taking this information, making sure that the drone stays in the air, uh, but also responsible to carry out any type of mission it was programmed for. A very important component is the telemetry, like radio-based telemetry, which is responsible for transmitting from the drone the data to your ground station, where you will be able to, um, to follow the mission of the drone. But at the same time, if you need to change something of, of the mission in real time, you can also trans transmit the mission commands and like cancel the mission or adapt it or whatever. Uh, but you have a direct control to the drone as far as this radio connection is happening. Normally, you have also the, the, the control and planning software uh, installed on the same ground station, which is generally a computer or also a tablet or smartphone. There is also remote control, which will allow you always to take con over control over the drone manually to bring it back in case something else fails. And most importantly, you have the sensor, uh, which will be used to do some type of remote sensing. So the drone itself is just a carrier of these sensors. We will be looking at the most important ones later on. Now, I would like to give you, um, do a comparison between drones and also meant uh, airplanes, which normally are called airborne and sat satellite solutions. Uh, because as good as drones are for certain things, they're not good for everything as we will see. Although the idea today is to do some publicity for drones. Okay, let's start talking about the operational altitude. So satellites that work around 500 plus kilometers I brought this example of Landsat 7, which is uh, positioned at 700 kilometers uh, in orbit, while, while men aircrafts will be uh, traveling uh, at a, just a few kilometers height. 
And then we have the drones, which literally can fly from, from ground level to, let's say, maybe 500 meters. And I'm talking about typical values for civil drones, not necessarily for the military ones. And OK, this is just for the comparison. Now, in this image, we have quite schematically, uh, I positioned the clouds between the drones and the airplane and obviously the satellite. And this is maybe one of the biggest advantages of drones. And I want to show you why. So this is a satellite image of uh, central Borneo, central Kalimantan in Indonesia, where we had to work. And the, the probability to get an image at some moment in time where you don't have clouds is, is as good as zero. Um, I have been, I worked there for six weeks and this image I am showing now uh, shows uh, image taken from the drone and you see how the drone is traveling uh, underneath the clouds. So being able to map without any direct interference of the clouds. But during the six weeks, this was a scenario I had to work in. So this makes it possible to map areas without having this influence of, of clouds. And uh, I suppose there are many people here from the tropics they will know that it's quite difficult to have a day without clouds in some zones all over the year. So this is one of the biggest advantages of drones. Okay, the other aspect I would like to, to comment is the resolution issue. So satellite images have resolutions going from like 15 meters down to half a meter. There are satellite images with, which have a much higher uh, resolution, but they're probably not really accessible from the point of view of price for end consumers. And this goes down to the drones with, let's say, 15 centimeters to one centimeter resolution. And just to give you an example, this is exact the same spot. Uh, this is an image taken from a, a satellite image with a 10 meter per pixel resolution. And this image here is one taken with a drone, and it's obvious that we're talking about completely different uh, image reality. So in this case, the drone is also uh, unbeatable compared to the satellite. Very quickly about the position frequency. What, since you own the drone or have access to a drone uh, and you're able almost independently of being cloudy or not uh, to bring the drone into the air, you can repeat your uh, mappings uh, as often as you want. So you could have like a repetition frequency uh, of a daily basis if you would need to. With a plane, it's a bit different because there are also some administrative and some other issues you have to clarify. So we will be talking maybe between days and months, but the satellite image because of its availability, the climate issue and so on, um, one could say that you have like a, a repetition frequency of uh, a monthly basis. So again, the drone is very flexible there. But now we arrive to the point where the drone has its limitations. So depending on which drone you use, you will be able to map like 500 to 2000 hectare a day, uh, assuming a resolution of 10 centimeter per pixel. With a normal plane, obviously this will be much higher, but um, a satellite image is unbeatable because it's able to map almost half a million hectare with one single image. Although we have to, I have to mention that here we're talking about high resolution and here this would be like an example of a five meter resolution. But this means that if, you're, if you really want to, to map a few dozen of thousands of hectare, that's where the drone really um, gets to its limits of practicality. And finally, um, because of this high resolution, because of the nature of the mapping, it's possible to extract 3D information uh, from the landscape or from the images you're doing of the landscape, uh, which is possible with the drone as we will see later on. There also, there was a list of negative points uh, I decided to throw away. Uh, the, the, <laughs> there are a lot also in that direction. Uh, I decided just to bring this last uh, slide uh, where the drone is also unbeatable. Uh, and I won't go through this list, but just to say that the access to drone uh, really um, makes it more democratic 
to have access to data. So uh, drones are quite are used a lot within communities, not to say indigenous communities, to have control over their area, like for mapping, for uh, tracking of illegal activities, and all the data they generate is immediately available and is also um, um, is of their own ownership. So I think drones uh, are like a small revolution there because they allow access to data to for these communities or also NGOs and so on. So this is a quite positive uh, impact of the drone in the society. Okay, so sensors. There's a lot to say about sensors, but I limited this uh, whole afternoon part of sensors to one single slide. Obviously, everyone knows that drones can be equipped with video cameras or photo cameras. In fact, normally nowadays, it's the same device which is able to do both. Um, but most interesting, more interesting, uh, interesting is that within cameras, we have thermal cameras, infrared cameras, or even multispectral cameras. So they're really interesting for conservation applications, uh, and in particular to study uh, vegetation cover and their health uh, situation. Um, yeah, that's all I will say to that. But there are all other sensors, and I'm just bringing in LiDAR because it's also quite fa fascinating sensor. It's a laser um, scanning device, and this is also quite interesting for a forest uh, because it is able to, to detect or to measure the whole forest structure from canopy down to the ground. But today we will just look at the photo camera as a sensor and why is it that we will look only that because we're talking about mapping using photo cameras and that's the base and the basis using photos to do mapping is photogrammetry. So let's let us have a quick look on what photogrammetry is. I try to to understand this from different definitions, different languages, from different historical backgrounds. It's a bit of confusion, so I decided to create my summary or my description of what photogrammetry is. And it is the procedure to extract 3D information from a set of photos, which in fact are 2D. And I will try to explain how this works. Now, to, to explain the photogrammetric uh, procedure, I decided to go directly over to our um, uh, study case, which is the mapping. And so we have our forest here and we have our drone, which is flying over this forest. And every few meters, it will take a photo and you see the images appearing here. And so what this shows is already one of the most important issues and which I will be now talking about for a few minutes. Uh, namely, the photos need to overlap. This is an absolute precondition for ph photogrammetry to work, uh, namely that the photos overlap. If they don't overlap or the overlap is just uh, um, marginal, uh, that won't, the, the photogrammetry won't, will not work. <clears throat> so once you have captured these different images, what is the next step? The idea is that you take pairs of overlapping photos and detect points which are equivalent between these two photos. So what you see here are blue points, which by the way are called tie points in this context, which appear in this image, but also in that image. So in the past, this was done by hand. So it's a bit crazy to think that there was time people did this manually. Nowadays, you have software solutions which, with powerful image analysis algorithms which are able to detect uh, thousands, if not millions of points. So you see here uh, an example of two pairs of points which are equivalent, but in this image, the situation is like this. So we have probably uh, thousands or dozens of thousands of points which um, are equivalent. And this happens for all the images which overlap uh, in your collection of image you took. Now, what does the software 
uh, do with this information. It will compare or let's say analyze the geometry of those points between the images and within the image and through a process of triangulation will be able not only to, de to determine the position on the, of the camera, its orientation, but also to, to determine the 3D position of each individual point in 3D space. Sounds a bit complicated, but the result looks like something like this. So this is the result of this alignment of images and the creation of the 3D point clouds through this photogrammetric process. Once you have created this, uh, there's a second step, namely what is named a densification of the point cloud. So from this sparse point cloud, the next step is increasing this density and you start seeing a 3D structure, although we're lo just looking at individual points in space. And from there, you go through creating a 3D model of, of this dense point cloud. And once you get here, what the software does is to create a digital surface model. And this is what you see here. Now, it looks like 3D, but this is only because the software brings in uh, a shadowing in this uh, representation. But in fact, a digital surface model is a 2D map of every elevation or the elevation or well, say it in another way, each pixel in this image uh, has a value of the elevation at that spot. So you're able to measure here the elevation of everything you see in your landscape. There are different representations of this, uh, but I will talk about this later on. Now, we're getting to the really final step of this whole thing. With all the 3D information and on the way, the software also calculated some depth maps for each individual photo. What the software will do is to take each individual photo it took initially and does an auto ratification of those images to create an auto mosaic, like projecting each photo in a corrected way um, perpendicular to the ground. And this is what you see here. So in my example, I used five photos and you see that from each photo, there's a piece which was, uh, let's say, recycled in some way to create this map. But you see that also trees and so on use pieces of the, of the other photos. And like this, there is this auto mosaic, uh, which at the end is like what we sometimes call the photo map, which is what really interests us as a final product. So I hope you could uh, <laughs> follow me on this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we will probably visit that later on again. Now, getting to, um, to the planning and execution of a mission. The first step is to acquire a drone. And people quite often, uh, they, they go into a uh, electronic store and buy the first drone and then they start thinking okay how will I use this drone to map my landscape but the thing should be uh, the other way around so first of all ask a lot of questions unfortunately I won't be able to go through this um, <clears throat> but I will give you some examples of questions you should be doing before acquiring a drone and maybe the first one is what size has the area you want to map? Are we talking just about one, two to 10 hectare, or are we talking about square kilometers? Because based on what I presented you earlier, um, um, you know, when I was presenting the fixed wing and the, and the multi-copter, if I know which area I'm going to fly, probably I will so, uh, choose a multi-copter to fly over this smaller area but I will for sure invest in a fixed wing to fly over these gigantic areas here. But that's not all. So another example of a question you should be asking is how accessible is the area? So I'm bringing you this example uh, of a mission we had to, should have been, well, we wanted to do, we didn't do because we forgot to ask this question. And what you see here is the jungle of Surinam. You see you have, you have here a road 
but the area we had to map was like five kilometers away. And it's not that you need a drone that gets there and goes back. You, I mean, the drone will be mapping this and will be flying additional few kilometers up here. And so the area, the, the, the tra trajectory it has to fly here is of 15 kilometers. So the whole thing together gives, okay, at least 25 kilometers with one battery or with one flight should be possible. At the time we were working with this drone. So the, the, the commercial, com well, the company said it would fly 25 minutes, but at the end it really never flew more than 15 minutes. On the other hand, we later on, we start working with this drone, which uh, is an open source based drone and it was able to fly up to 1.5 hours. Now, if we consider like a velocity of 10 to 15 meters per second, this drone would not be able to fly more than 12 kilometers during one flight, while this one would be able to fly 70 kilometers. So for our situation previously, which we wanted to do with this drone and didn't do it because we failed to think about this, uh, as one point amongst so many others uh, 10 years ago. Uh, nowadays, I would say, obviously, before you buy this one, think if you would, will not need this one to do that type of, um, of mission. And a last example of a question you should be doing, how is your landscape uh, like? Are we talking about open spaces like this one, although we have a bit forest here, but you have some agriculture, or are we talking about dense forests along kilometers and kilometers? And again, the question would, the answer would probably be, okay, in this one, I can just use a fixed wing because there's space for takeoff, but within the forest, probably I would have to choose a multi-copter or a hybrid. Well, these are quite simple um, examples. And there are many other things you have to consider, weather condition, is the drone, um, can it fly in rain and so on. So the list is quite long. My message is think about what you have to take care of during your mission and do, don't be too hostile in cho choosing your drone system and, and really ask these questions and make a list for when you will buy the drone, uh, not to buy something that you won't be able to use. Okay, so now that we have our drone, independently if it's a multi-copter or a fixed wing, let's have a look at some considerations when you're planning and executing uh, the mission of a uh, mapping mission. Just one second. So probably the most important parameter is the flight height. Um, although this seems like trivial, uh, there are a lot of implications um, when choosing uh, the uh, flight height. So the first question is, how does that, how does the, the flight altitude uh, influence the final resolution? So one thing seems obvious, but uh, we have to start here. Uh, the higher I fly with my drone, the bigger will be the area each photo will be seen when taken and vice versa. So that seems obvious. Now, two other parameters we have to think which are related to the photo camera we're using is there's a total resolution or well, there's a resolution of the camera sensor with the total number of pixel. And then there's a field view of the camera, which is this opening angle here. And all these three things combined will result in the final resolution of your images, or let's say of your auto mosaic, which is measured in centimeters per pixel. And again, this seems obvious, but um, I think it's important just really to mention it once, is the lower you fly, the higher will be the resolution of your final map and vice versa. Just to give you an idea of, of a few values here, if I'm flying, let's say with a typical drone, around 150 meters, the resolution will be around five centimeters per pixel. And if I fly double the, the altitude, uh, obviously the resolution will be half as big, um, oh, sorry, uh, half as small. Well, it will be a smaller resolution, uh, double number here. <clears throat> now there's another 
uh, aspect, which is uh, related to the altitude. Again, we have our drone moving in space and every distance D, it will take a, a photo. So what you see here is that there will be an overlap between these photos and there are regions where even all the three photos will have a common uh, surface. Obviously, if I fly lower and I maintain this distance here, the overlap will be uh, lower. And as you remember, at some point, the photogrammetry will not work if the overlap is too small. So there is a minimal overlap that needs to be guaranteed for the photogrammetry to work. So one thing you can do here is to reduce this, this value which is in fact what one does in, in praxis, uh, which corresponds also to a higher frequency of taking photos. But there is a limitation mainly for the fixed wings because they have a minimal necessary velocity. And so they will be flying a few meters a second and maybe the camera cannot go that quick. So the only approach here is again to increase the altitude to maintain this overlap There's another issue which is related to the flight altitude. So if I show you these two images and I ask you to identify what are the similarities or what are the corresponding areas or structures within the image, I think it's quite obvious that you will say, okay, I see this here and see that there, and that's the same. So that's also where the, the software will identify equivalent points. But this is a quite flat landscape. If I show you this image, um, which we're taking just one after the other within maybe two or three seconds, um, you will have more difficulties to say, okay, that point there is that point there, no, uh, well. And I can give you an example. So this tree here is this tree there. And maybe after searching a bit, you will identify this part. But if I look, to on this area and really look at what the pixels are showing, this image is completely different from that image. So probably the photogrammetry software, because the structure is so different, would not be able to identify points here, which, and, and you know, relate them to points there. And what is the issue here? If I have a tree, even if it's standing, let's say it's standing, freely on, on some countryside, and I take a photo from above, I will see something like this now, in a quite schematic uh, way. If I look at the images which we're taking before and after flying over this, this tree, I will see a completely different uh, image. And this is related to the very strong perspective, or it's a perspective uh, issue, uh, where you will have a distortion or just another view over the tree uh, between these three positions. Now, the lower you fly and the more structure your landscape has and forests, like in this situation with holes and with different canopies uh, are a very good example of a very complex structure. The lower you fly, the more you will have this perspective problem. So. Yeah, that's one thing. There's another problem. And that has to do, or I'm, I tried to show it here. If you have objects in your landscape and you have like different uh, positions from where the photo was taken, um, it might happen that certain areas, certain surfaces like this red uh, line here or the blue one here will be seen only by one camera. So this camera sees this one, but it doesn't see that one and vice versa. And if it happens that this surface appears only in one image, and like I said initially, you need at least two, if not more than two images to be able to reconstruct your model, this image or the 3D model will have a hole here. Now, the way you can uh, address this problem and the previous one is, uh, which this one I call like the shadow zone, uh, and the other one was the problem with the strong perspective uh, issue, is by increasing the density of photos. Um, 
This will lead to a higher overlap between the neighboring photos, which is already better, but overall it will also increase the quantity of overlapping photos in, in total. And then you will have a bigger chance to, to describe this type of uh, complex structures in your landscape. Now, just to give you an example of how this overlap values are defined in, in, in the praxis and what typical values are. So I have my flight trajectory here. And the drone is doing this, uh, this line here, turning down now and, you know, just follow the line. And taking like one foot off the other and then coming back. There are two types of overlaps you have to consider. So you have the overlap of the images along the flight. So this would be um, called longitudinal overlap. And you have the transversal, which is between the photos which were made during two different paths here. Now the numbers which are given in applications which will plan your mission are typically lower as what I'm showing here. Like typically here, you will have 60%, here 65 to 70%. But if you're flying over a forest, for instance, it's important that you really go up in this value. So the longitudinal overlap, 70% would be enough. But this one, you really can pump this up to 85% to really to be really sure that, that this overlap is enough to reconstruct your forest. Obviously, the higher this is, uh, the more time the drone will be in air because you will have more path to, or the trajectory is, is longer. Okay, maybe there's some words I would say about the topography, but I will just jump that and... Well, the thing is, maybe just one word here, typical, mission planners, they plan within a plane, uh, one, one altitude. If you're working in hilly landscapes, that might be a problem because your drone might uh, fly into a mountain. The message here is have this in, in consideration. And if you need fly in this plane over the first part of the mountain and then move to another flight altitude to be sure you never fly against the mountain. There are other implications in this case, but um, we will we talk about this another day. Now, finally, and I will fast forward here, maybe just a few words. There are like four phases of a mission. First of all, the pre-flight part. You have to prepare your drone, the equipment, you have to prepare the mission with a few considerations. Uh, keeping a few considerations I just mentioned in mind, uh, and then you have to upload the mission to the drone. The takeoff starts with checking the system, uh, preparing the drone, etc., and then really starting the flight until the drone uh, achieves uh, altitude, which is considered as uh, secure. The mission itself uh, normally is autonomous, uh, but you should always have a control over what is happening in case something goes wrong, so you can intervene and bring the drone back. And the landing is quite similar. Um, also there, you have to um, supervise the whole thing so that the drone arrives uh, safe and to the ground. Now, an important thing here is depending on the system, some of these phases are fully manual, uh, some are assisted, means you have to control them, but the computer helps you to do that. And end consumer drones normally do everything automatically. And that's the good news about all of this thing. And what we are going to show is a very short video uh, we did, as I mentioned before, a few days ago. And I will start it now and I hope you will be able to hear the sound. Here we are uh, on the field and I will demonstrate how to use uh, a quadcopter to do a mapping of a forest. Uh, I brought my DJI uh, Mavic Pro. I will show you now how many components this system has. So we have the drone itself, uh, which is this small. 
you have to open the arms where the propellers are attached to and the motors. So this is the drone. We have the remote control, which looks like this. So this remote control will always work uh, with a mobile phone or any, any portable device. And this time I will be using a tablet to, uh, to do the whole mission planning. Try to plan everything in advance like the day before. Uh, don't try to do this on the field. Now, because the place I chose today was not defined yesterday, uh, because I just chose some random place, I will do the planning here. Uh, but this is only possible because I have internet connection here. So the next step will be to prepare everything for the flight, which means connecting the devices. So today I will be uh, using my tablet connected to the remote control, uh, which will be used, let's say, as a telemetry interface uh, to the drone. And I will do my mission planning on the tablet, and I will show that once we are ready to, to go. Uh, so what I did now is to connect the remote control to the tablet, and I will go over now to, the, to planning the mission. There are different um, applications you can use. So on my tablet, I have two applications for mapping, which is Pix4D Capture. It's a, uh, a free application. But today we are going to use drone deploy. But at the end, both uh, work uh, quite the same. So I will start the application. The application needs a, a login. So before you uh, start it, uh, make sure that you are logged in or before you go to the field. Uh, I did this yesterday evening, so I have the direct access to, to the dashboard and I will start a new project. The first step within Drone Deploy is to search for the place where you're going to fly. Once the app has brought you to the place you were searching for, you have now to identify the area you're going to map. Click on Create Project here to start with the next step. The application has two mission modes, Maps and Models and Photo Report. We will select the first one. A square polygon appears, showing the flight trajectories in green. Adapt the polygon to the area you want to map by picking and dragging the corners to the limit of the area. For this demonstration, I will work with the initial square, so I will undo these changes. In this example, you see that we have perpendicular trajectories. This is important if you want to make sure that all the details of your landscape are recorded. The more photos you take from different perspectives, the better will be the 3D model at the end. A precondition if you want to do high accurate analysis later on. But for our simple mapping purposes, we don't need the perpendicular ones. So we will remove them by deactivating the enhanced 3D option. Our flight altitude is set to 60 meters, which corresponds to a 1.4 centimeters per pixel. With this configuration, and considering that our polygon has only two hectares, the drone will be able to map it with one battery. The flight time will be around six minutes and around 80 photos will be taken. Although we have removed the perpendicular flight lines, we can still guarantee that the flight will be successful or let's say that the reconstruction of the 3D model at the end using photogrammetry is successful by changing the side overlap of the images. To do so, we go to the advanced mode, deactivate the automatic settings, and then we can change the side overlap parameter. For instance, going from 70% to 85%. Consequently, more photos will be taken and the flight time will be longer. But for today's demonstration, I will go back to the 70% side overlap just by turning on the automatic settings again. There is much more to say about the different parameters and the influence they have on the mission and in the quality of the data we will be generating later on. But as the time is limited, I hope we will find the opportunity to discuss all of these aspects sometime in the future. Now that everything is ready, I will click on the start pre-flight checklist and the software will check if all the parameters of the drone are ready for a flight. So that's the case and I get the green light that I can start the flight, which I will do next.
While the drone is gaining altitude, let's have a look at the mission software. I normally like to check immediately all the parameters to make sure that everything is fine. Drone deploy allows switching to the live view, which is being streamed down from the drone, which also helps to check the quality of the image. As soon as the drone reaches the target altitude, it will move towards the first waypoint where the mission will begin. As soon as the drone arrives at the first waypoint, it starts taking photos in a regular interval. At any moment we can switch to the drone camera to see which images it's capturing. Although the mission is taking place in a full autonomous way, I really recommend to keep your eyes on the mission software. This allows you to react in case there is some problem, to bring back your drone manually or intervene in some way to save the mission. Let's now fast forward to the end of the mission. Once the drone reaches the last waypoint, it starts coming back to the place where it took off. In the next few moments, I will be fetching the drone with my hands. However, if you're new working with this type of drones, don't do this. Make sure that you have prepared the place where the drone has taken off with a clean surface so that the drone can land without any damage. With the conclusion of the mapping, the next step will be to copy the images from the drone to the computer and start with the photogrammetry calculations. Okay, so I hope this video gave you a very let's yeah, um, uh, basic insight in how uh, such a mission can be planned, executed. Uh, I must say, and that's why um, DJI and this DJI drones, Mavic Pros, and and the later versions are so um, attractive because it's. It's difficult to be easier to, to work easier than with these drones. Um, in other systems, it's a bit more complicated. There is more programming, there is uh, more planning. Uh, but I decided to show you this version because this is really what everyone probably uh, watching this would be able to do uh, in, in real life. So maybe we will be talking about this later on also. Now, the next step would be the whole photogrammetry process. So since it's not possible to show this, let's say in real time, I did prepare quickly a small, a small video yesterday and Alex will probably share it in, uh, in the chat. So it's on YouTube, uh, let's say it's exclusive for you. Um, so have a look at it later on. It's like 15 minutes showing the whole procedure. I already explained within the context of photogrammetry, but there you'll see how this works using a software. And let's go over to uh, possible mapping applications and analysis. Just remember, we have the Orto Mosaic as a final product, but also the density, uh, the digital elevation models. Now, the first thing which these maps, these photo maps, um, uh, can help you is to do, let's say, a qualitatively analysis of what you see in the image. The resolution is so high that just with a simple eye, you will be able uh, to detect species um, or also detect illegal logging sites and so on. So already this is, is, is just a, a pure advantage uh, in, in regards to some other imagery you might be collecting. But it's not only about the, the RGB images, like the orto mosaic. And to give you an example, how powerful also the digital surface model is, I'm showing you this image. So here you see green, uh, you see some structure of the forest, but you really don't understand uh, how the forest structure looks like. But if I look at my digital surface model, uh, immediately I see 
uh, the full structure of the forest, where are the holes, where are individual trees, and so on. But the digital surface model uh, allows doing much more. Just remember, each pixel gives you uh, the elevation within that coordinate, so you have really this, uh, this map of elevation over your landscape. And you can do stuff like here, uh, like detecting, detect, uh, detecting individual trees, uh, um, measuring the, 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 the limits between the canop, uh, the, the, yeah, the trees and the structure of the canopy. You can measure like uh, um, diameter of the trees. So everything you see here is resulting from some analysis of the digital surface model. But there's even a much simpler way of using them. And this example shows you uh, mapping we de did before and after logging activities in a tropical forest. So if I show you these two images, probably you, don't, you won't see too much the difference. But if I switch between the first and the second one, you see how the trees uh, disappear uh, after the logging. And just by doing quite simple mathematics, like subtracting the first from the second or the second from the first one, uh, you can quickly create a map of missing trees there. Um, you can also use this digital surface models in a quite simple way to, to detect uh, forest growth or measure forest growth rates. So what you see here is a reforestation area and we did map, I did map it 2011, also 2014, uh, but uh, the last measurement was 2015. So what I decided to do is to take the digital surface model from the first mapping and from the last mapping, already changing from one to the other, you see the trees growing. But if I subtract both, I get the difference between the initial situation and, and the final situation. If you go a step further and like do a, a cut through your map or digital surface model, you can produce graphs like this showing how the, the trees have been growing over this period of time. Um, so this is everything I have to show now uh, with regards to uh, analysis of the data. And there probably we have colleagues which do much more analytics and can extract much more um, information. But what you just saw now is stuff that you yourself can do. You don't need expertise to do this. <clears throat> now, concluding this part of the mapping, I just want to show you uh, another thing you can do with drones and in particular with the multicopters. Uh, as you remember, you can position the multicopter uh, at a certain coordinate in the 3D space, and you can rotate the copter and do uh, a panorama by taking several photos and create something like, uh, let's say, an aerial street view. And I will show you uh, a work we did. So Ross already showed a similar one. And this is a high resolution panorama of the same area I just showed you previously where we did the other measurements. But the cool thing here is we managed to position the drone with, you know, with sub meter precision at the same spot years later and did a second panorama. And what you will see now is the forest growing. And this um, you can uh, we will share later on this link so you can play around but going back four years and now advancing four years so this is is really a very nice way to present uh, the, for, the forest growth from a very uh, qualitative way but it really impresses whoever is watching this <clears throat> Now, another thing uh, as I, we're doing, and as I explained initially, uh, Open Forest is about helping organizations to show their projects in building up transparency. So we worked a lot with web maps in, in the past where people could uh, interact with uh, online maps, uh, visit the reforestation sites, and so on. 
And what we did was to consolidate all of these products we did in the past into one single platform, which is now accessible for everyone, which we called uh, Explorer.land. So as we were talking about drones and, and, <clears throat> and, and, and auto mosaics or drone maps, I will just show you an example of a project of a, um, a user of our platform. So this is in Panama. And now we have this interactive map and the user has been doing different um, drone mappings and creating this high resolution uh, and wonderful uh, orto mosaics. And I will show you how the base layer, uh, how the landscape see, um, looks like here. And you see that, uh, if you see it because it's quite dark here, there are absolutely no trees. And like one, two years later, with their drone map, they're able to show how they reforested everything with a high level of detail. Now, the really fascinating thing is, if you start doing these maps of the smaller areas, let's say on a yearly basis, what Explore that land will allow you to do is like an animation, a chronological animation where you see the landscape changing and your forest growing. And this is one of the main goals we have with Explorer to build up this transparency. Now, I'm finally getting to an end and just really a few words. Drones are getting um, more and more secure, but still they are instruments which, uh, if um, not used well, can do harm. And there are two main aspects where you should really take care is uh, taking care about people and property, also from a privacy point of view, uh, but maybe more importantly is even to respect wildlife. So it might happen that if you're flying with a drone, in a conservation area, you will have animals and in particular birds, which will be quite aggressive towards the drone and attack the drone. And it will not only harm the animal, but also lose, probably lose your drone. And if you look for this in online, you will see uh, hundreds of examples of drones being attacked by, by, by animals and mainly birds. So this is just really to call your attention to keep this part in mind because it's so important as everything else I have said previously. And finally, um, in the meantime, almost every country has a legislation uh, where it's where, where you which says what you can do and what you cannot do with the drones. Unfortunately, there's a lot, normally there's a lot you cannot do which you would need to do to do a, a, a correct mapping. So please check in your country what the situation is, if you need some authorization, if you need some type of schooling, but take this seriously, uh, because I mean, in some way, the, the, the law is there to, you know, to protect uh, nature and, and people. So take also this into account. And yeah, finally, uh, after, I don't know, didn't look at my watch. Yeah, one hour exactly, 15 minutes more than I planned. We are coming to our question and answer uh, session. Awesome. Thank you so much, Patrick. So informative. I definitely learned some uh, new stuff as well, some stuff I hadn't seen in there. So super great. Um, we are just so excited to be able to share and connect and uh, different people have different experiences with drones and let this be the start of the conversation. Patrick and I are both available um, by email. Uh, you can feel free to reach out to us after if you think of questions later or you want to be connected to any of the other partners that you saw presented about. Um, we're both very eager to figure out how we can help uh, each other learn. There was a huge uh, interest in this. Um, there's still 100, almost 150 of you here, which is fantastic. Um, so yeah, thank, thanks everybody. And we, we can go through a couple of the questions that weren't answered yet in the Q&A. Um, and if you have uh, more questions, don't hesitate to keep going. 
Um, also, the, maybe just um, Alex or my colleague, he will share also a link uh, where you can leave a feedback. So it's just a very small feedback form. It would interest us a lot to, to, to understand how, yeah, what your feedback about this webinar is, because it's the first time we do it in this, in this context. There's, I mean, there's just a one-way communication in some way. Um, but please, um, if you're so nice, uh, uh, fill out that form and, and for us to learn what we can improve next time. Or, and very important for us is to understand what are your fields of interest. And probably we will do uh, another webinar uh, or a series of smaller webinars in the near future based on your feedback. Okay. Um, one of the questions that I, th I thought was a good one that was directed at you, Patrick, maybe you hadn't had a chance to see in the q and I'll just go ahead and read it uh, from Samuel Pacheco. Uh, Dr. Patrick, is it possible to calculate the amount of carbon accumulated in trees in a specific area or even model carbon that will be accumulated along, say, five to ten years at a restoration area? If yes, any software recommendations? So that's a great, a great question that I'm yeah, answering. Yeah. <laughs> the, the same one we we are doing all the time, so uh, I think it's not so simple uh, as that. Obviously, if you have information about the volume, um, if, if you one thing I didn't show, so at some point or depending on your landscape, you could even subtract the 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 the, the terrain. Uh, model the topography from the rest and keep only the altitude of the trees individually. But I think it's a bit more complicated because uh, you will need to know the species. Probably there is like an average value you could use there. But if you measuring the height of the trees, uh, you can then correlate that maybe with some volume or amount of, of carbon. Uh, but I think it's really a much more complicated question than just saying, okay, I will do this type of mapping, I will create my 3D model and some uh, magical software will, uh, will calculate my carbon. So I don't know exactly how to do it, I suppose, and I, I th it, it, sh it probably is possible using some, some uh, approaches, but I would not know exactly how to do it. I don't know if someone in, in the audience uh, wants to share a link with the answer. <laughs> yep, I feel I would have said the same thing. And already, thanks for folks in the audience for sharing uh, different tools that you all use because this has also been very educational for me, um, both from Patrick and from the chat uh, from folks weighing in. So, so thanks for that. Um, a lot of people are really interested in, in the software, um, and so I can certainly speak to a little bit about what we are exploring at One Tree Planted, and then would love to hear from you, Patrick, because I know you have different experiences. Um, but so far, we are mostly looking at uh, web-based software, um, the two that seem to be the strongest to me at the moment, and I don't know all of them, so I want to caveat. Uh, the two that seem the strongest to me are uh, drone deploy and Pix4D. They both have great discounts for nonprofits and make it pretty simple to uh, take photos and upload them and generate uh, both ortho mosaics and the 360 panos. Um, allow you to store a lot of data on the web. Don't require complicated softwares um, or laptops to to run them on. And pretty pretty automated. So those those are the two that I feel most confident about. But there's almost certainly more. And then there's different tools that um, can you can stitch together uh, the drone panel and upload it to a website that I heard about from Kevin from Wells for Zoecula.com. So that's a way to share. I shared a link to some images of mine in the in the chat. But yeah, I would love to hear from you, Patrick, um, about your yeah. different softwares. I have my original presentation. Uh... Just one second. Oops, I have to find my control. So we'll share my screen again. Oh, that's okay for you. So there, there are really a lot of solutions. And um, uh, maybe the two most popular ones were just mentioned, which is Drone Deploy and Pix4D. 
If you remember in the video, I showed the two applications I used to, to, to plan the mission and also control the drone during the flight are applications which are were created by Drone Deploy and Pix4D and are free uh, to use. Uh, and obviously with the idea that then immediately you upload the data to their servers and, and the whole calculation happens there. Um, I did work with this several years ago. I know that now at least Pix4D has also a desktop version. The problem is if you're capturing gigabytes in data, uh, uploading them to a server is not really the solution. So you would need a, a desktop uh, version of it. And so Pix4D has it for sure, drone deploy, I'm not really sure, but I suppose also. Um, but a software I really love uh, because it's really powerful and at least in the past um, generated better uh, solutions than uh, like Pix4D, but this might have changed. So I don't want to do bad publicity for Pix4D uh, is Agisoft or Agisoft, which is a Russian software and is the one I'm using in this video um, which Alex supposed probably shared uh, where I show how to use this. And so the software, Agisoft is the company, the software is now called MetaShape. They have also very interesting uh, discounts for NGOs. Um, it is still an investment, but if you're doing a lot of drone processing, this might really be interesting. Uh, you see here, there are a lot of others like SimActive. I think it comes from the satellite uh, world and um, is now also doing processing for, for drone uh, images, uh, but there are a lot of others. Um, and yeah, what is really interesting is that there is also an open source version. I, to be honest, I, I did, you can buy it like for 70 euro uh, uh, install. Um, um, file where, where you can install it on your desktop or you can, if you know how to work with servers, you can even work, uh, upload it and install it on the server and it works quite well. I, I suppose this was drone mapper. I'm not really sure. So, but just to say that there's really a lot, there are really a lot of solutions. Um, but that being said, these three are the most popular ones. Sorry, these three are the most popular ones and the ones I would recommend. At the end, it's always a question of, of costs um, and, and long-term probably buying a desktop software is the best solution uh, if you're doing really large, large areas. Um, maybe another, um, because we were talking about the photogrammetry software. Now, when it comes to, to the mission planning software, that's again, a completely different application. And normally each drone system has its own. So just for you to be clear that it's, there's only one software I know which is compatible with like dozens and dozens of drones, but the majority of them, well, these two applications from Pix4D and Drone Deploy are also compatible with many multi-copters. And I don't know if with fixed wings, but normally the, the software, the mission planning software comes with a drone. So that's, uh, there is not so much choice there at the end, if you're going to non-typical drones, let's say. I'm looking if there are more questions here. Um, let's see, what are some... Eliza Lowe, I can answer that one briefly. Um, I, she asks, what is the experience using drones for monitoring mangroves? Um, I was in Costa Rica with OSA Conservation just uh, in May this year and brought my DJI Mavic um, Air 2 and it was really easy, portable. Um, I, I, they present the, the challenge with mangroves, maybe just the wet environment may want to take off and land from your hand. Um, Maybe harder to do a fixed wing, but I see no unique challenges beyond that. Well, there's one challenge with mangroves. Um, so water is a problem. Like if you see the background of Ross, uh, that's a surface you would not be able to map because the, the, I mean, whatever you're mapping, it has to stay still. 
Uh, and we didn't go into details like mapping when trees are moving due to the wind that might lead to the failure of the photogrammetry. But now water is moving constantly. There is no second where the water surface looks similar twice. And so if the mangrove is mainly water and just a, a, a few small seedlings, you might have problems mapping that area. Obviously, if, if you start to have, let's say, 50, 50, uh, percent of the surface being uh, mangrove and the rest is water, then the reconstruction uh, will probably work. But if it's mainly water, that might be a problem. Uh, but I mean, I did also uh, map mangroves and it, at the end it, it worked. It really depends on the relation or the ratio between fixed objects in your landscape and moving objects like water, if it works or not. Yep. Um, Gyro, that's a great question about, is it mandatory a good internet connection to upload all your data? So there's a couple, the short answer is it's not, well, to upload it to the internet, uh, to have it on the cloud, it's certainly mandatory. There are softwares that can do these processing locally. Uh, so if internet is a challenge, you may need a software that runs on your laptop and can do the processing. I know my colleague Malcolm has used um, Agisoft to do that effectively. And, but if you're using something cloud-based like Drone Deploy or Pix4D, uh, you'll need a good internet connection. I see there are, there are really a lot of questions. Let me check. Uh, okay, so like Taylor is asking if, uh, if we have software suggestions for tree canopy coverage, detecting individual trees, diameter, and he's using drone to map and Arcus Pro. I have a DSM created, but I'm struggling to get useful data from that. So if you're doing it manually, well, let me say it in a different way. Uh, some, some of the images you saw previously, we, well, I did some experience in detecting individual trees or extracting them from a DSM. Now, the thing is, if you do it manually, and let's say with more classical uh, approaches, uh, being classical uh, opposed to uh, artificial intelligence based, um, it's, it's really hard. You need quite flat landscapes, uh, to, to, at least to, to my knowledge, in order to make uh, a, um, a clean subst subtraction of the terrain to be able then to, to work with the individual islands of trees. But then again, only if you're working with monocultures uh, or quite uh, regular um, forest structures. The moment you have uh, like a, a diverse uh, forest, uh, a mixed forest with different canopy heights. And so it really becomes uh, difficult. I suppose there are a lot of groups working on this. Um, I know one in Germany, they're doing also wonderful um, work. I would have to pick out the, the link later on, uh, but uh, it's it's really different di like, difficult if you're working with ArcGIS or QGIS to to really do some extractions and it really depends on on the situ this very specific situation of your landscape structure uh, if you're successful or not. So I really understand that uh, Taylor is struggling to get useful data. Uh, I would need to see it to give a bit more hints there, but maybe uh, by email later on. Um, I wanted to do a time check with you, Patrick. I do have another meeting here in a couple minutes. Uh, <laughs> I can certainly leave. And if you want to stick around and answer some questions or, or we could wrap up, like I said, we're certainly both available by email. I don't want to cut this short. Um, there's been so yeah. many great questions and really, really great participation. Um, so do you want to stick around for a few more minutes? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um... Or what we could do is uh, just take these questions and, and maybe make them available later on and send the link uh, to everyone. Um, like I asked previously, if you could fill out the feedback form, if the interest is really high, we might do another webinar uh, where we would address specific issues from the, from the, from the participants. So, um, I would like, yeah, you know, maybe we will stop now uh, since we have been talking for one and a half hour. Yep. Um, I'm sorry for the ones who where we weren't able now to to answer all the questions. 
Uh, but yeah, that's the proposal I, I will do or I'm doing to, to answer to them in, in writing and then send them to everyone. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you so much, Patrick and Open Forest team uh, for making this happen. And it's just been a pleasure. Um, it seems like we've just had really, really great engagement and uh, hope everyone learned as much as I did. But let this be the start of the conversation and not the end. Um, we're learning and growing together. There's a lot as the technology gets cheaper and better. There's just more and more opportunity to use these drones for monitoring and conservation work. Um, and we're, we're in this together. Um, so super appreciate uh, the engagement with folks and don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Thank you. And I hope you liked, uh, you learned something that's the most important part. See you next time. Ciao.